the moderating. Um, uh, please submit your questions for the q and in the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, and questions will be queued in the order received. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Desiree Sacher and uh, Aaron Leverett. Desiree is a security architect for a security operations center in the financial industry. And I think her ultimate goal is to create intelligent processes. Um, Aaron is a uh, senior scientist at Airbus Operations, co-author of Solving Cyber Risk and founder of Consinity Risks. So the talk is the intelligent process lifecycle of active cyber defenders. And last year, uh, Desiree uh, presented her taxonomy for documenting and improving uh, soft user case quality. It was very interesting. And um, now, they'll talk about how to bring back intelligence to more first-level security task, uh, tasks by extending the concept to more uh, first-level security verification disciplines. We establish the state of security that can help you initiate improvement steps uh, using in-house information. And uh, this should be something uh, everybody should be interested in, so take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm just going to quickly start into because it's a lot of information that I want to transmit here in this short presentation. I'm uh, Desiree. I'm a now principal security architect um, for the operational part of uh, Finance Informatic, which is a German IT service provider for the German saving banks. So we do lots of finance stuff. And I'm Aaron Leverett, joining you from uh, the lowlands of Cambridge instead of the highlands of Switzerland. Um, and I'm a senior scientist in cyber innovation, which is, uh, you know, it sounds like it's a made up uh, sort of term, but basically we do R&D and my focus there is on R&D in the risk space. Thank you. So I'm going to jump in right with where I ended last year. So for those who haven't seen the presentation last year, um, this is going to add on the taxonomy that I published last year. Last year, all of the information was put, pushed to my GitHub and first actually even sponsored a peer-reviewed version of that paper that I published about two years ago. So this can, uh, all of the links and everything can be found on that GitHub. Now, last year I presented those eight categories and my main goal was to make security monitoring a little bit easier on the analysts and to show where their problems were coming from because lots of the alerts that the analysts do get are like coming from everywhere and i divided it by if it was caused by a process problem or a configuration problem if the SOC can actually do something about it or if some member of the company an engineer for example needs to do some adjustments and i wanted to get some quality results on how the products are actually working and of course the most important ones were the confirmed attack with ir actions and the confirmed attack attempt without the ir actions which pretty much means that they accepted the risk that you don't go further with the alerts at hackaloo i presented the KPIs or some of KPIs that I would suggest that we could take from those tech, uh, from this taxonomy. And this talk was also recorded. The link uh, can be found on the GitHub as well. And at CybercrimeCon from Group IB, I went on and created some external threat heat map, which is actually based on only the confirmed attack um, with IR actions and the confirmed attack attempts without IR actions. So pretty much what you should be seeing from outside. And it was combined with some MITRE attack techniques and from the criticality sorted. And I also created those internal security heat maps, which were more based on the internal stuff that is going wrong. So unannounced admin actions and detection, device rule, configuration errors, all of that kind of stuff. So now we have this update. <laughs> and this is pretty much caused by the um, recent and, well, we all have been going more towards cloud. And um, after um, Hackaloo, I was approached to actually transliterate uh, this whole taxonomy to uh, compliance and integrity monitoring, just to make sure that we can also see the configuration of such devices. And I'm still uh, convinced that detection of configuration changes, especially in the cloud, are also very important. And the SOC service quality reflects overall security quality of state. So, I mean, if if the SOC, SOC is the one place where you get all of the alerts from all of the company of the things that are going wrong. And if I'm looking at the last few years, it doesn't look like we, like we did get less to do. So what I actually did, I didn't only 
transliterated to the integrity and compliance monitoring, but I also looked at vulnerability management and what is actually going wrong there. Because I'm still convinced, and this was already put in the last presentation last year, that the SOC is really the place where you see all the errors and things that are going wrong. And if you don't want to screw all the analysts, then you should be making sure that they can articulate their problems in the right way. So and this I is sort of where um, where I came into the story uh, briefly, like um, uh, Desiree had done all this great work and, and you can go back and view some of that older work. But if you haven't seen it before, we're, we're going to present some new things here. And the gist of it was that she had done this great work uh, making a taxonomy for all these different categories of things that can and do go wrong. And then she was mapping that into risk. And I, I know that a lot of people traditionally have viewed risk as um, a subset of compliance, but I want to encourage you to think about this the other way around. Compliance is one tool for managing risks, and it's certainly not the only one. I personally got into risk because I was tired of viewing risk as only a kind of compliance exercise. So one of the things we're going to do today is as we go through some of the taxonomies and some of the details, we're going to try and map those to risks and treatments and, and clarify some of that stuff about risk. Thank you, Erin. Yes. So what I created and what was last week posted on GitHub already is this poster. And it looks really messy probably for many people that haven't looked at it a little bit in detail, but it should display all of the categories that I came up with for false positive states and error types and problems. And you pretty much see the uh, categories for integrity compliance configuration monitoring, the ones for security event and incident management. So the security monitoring part, as well as the vulnerability. And it was heavily based. I tried to include the continuous improvement action in this poster. So the colors um, actually should highlight on where the next action should be going. And this pretty much was caused because taking errors for everything would have been really messy. So yeah, but um, the focus really is on this continuous improvement, because if we highlight and have these categories, we can always go to a next step. And what I tried to include as well was this paper published by Lockheed Martin like a while ago, the intelligence driven computer network defense informed by analyzers of adversary campaigns and intrusion <laughs> chains. So this um, pretty much they just say that everything that you try to um, if you can't prevent it, try to detect it at least. And you should always make sure that if you can't deny the action completely, then you should at least try to degrade, disrupt, deceive it. And if you can't detect it, you might be able to discover it. So just make sure that you always have one of these actions covered. So the reference link goes to the details, but I found this paper really helpful and interesting. So I'm jumping right into just because of the time running. Um, this is the categories that I came up with for integrity and compliance configuration monitoring. And in this presentation, I only added the follow up actions because um, really for time saving issues and all of this is already put into a paper like the last one. So it's pretty similar and also from the whole way that I created it. And um, so on the GitHub, you do find detailed explanation of what every category is and um, how this can be used. And um, so, for example, if you have alleged violation with mischanged documentation, your follow up action will be a just baseline configuration and document the change. If you have a, a configuration error in the baseline, you your engineer probably needs to review the baseline and uh, go on with that. So. This is pretty much the category. It's divided again in company problems and what can the sol uh, so so resolve themselves and what are the strategic values that you want to get from it. So this is pretty much the framework that you should already know from the last publication. So I will just go on and jump to the next wheel. And this is the one from vulnerability management. And vulnerability management is not only, I mean, <clears throat> if you see this, from a perspective of a SOC that is not only doing services for an internal company, but also for an external one, you usually have a vulnerability, vulnerability scanner in place that tells you this is an alert and there, or this is a vulnerability that should be fixed. And um, you will most likely get one of those two responses here. You get either that the vulnerability verification is mistaken, so your scanner is apparently wrong, or you will get context of the exploitability is not given, is given, is not given. so you have like, it's not actually a problem because your vulnerability scanner doesn't look at it at the right angle and you probably have like a WAF or something in between and you're behind the WAF, so it's not a problem. Well, yeah, this is very, very possible. 
but um, you should be documenting those things and what are the responses that you're getting. And um, we are here still with vulnerability if it was relevant, if they are now with no, it wasn't relevant, but if it was relevant, then you still have the possibility that it can't be pre prevented on time. So you always want, want to make sure, can you take some actions like right on time, or if you can't fulfill the time, then you want to make sure that you find some other steps that you can do. And um, Aaron, do you want to jump in on that or I will just- Sure, yeah. It? Yeah, the, um, I think the point here is that we all know that, that SOC workers and defenders of networks are exhausted. They're working really hard. So if you're scanning for all of these different vulnerabilities and you're continually getting pushback saying, oh, this one doesn't apply because we have a WAF or because we have this other mitigation or we're catching that in the IDS or whatever, that's still a question of your scope uh, not being useful uh, because you don't need to scan for these things if the context is being discarded on a more permanent basis. Um, or you might want to scan for them because you, you're looking for um, when the WAF stops working, for example. And those are great reasons to do these things, but you still need to document why you made those decisions and what's going on. And this is particularly important when you're um, a SOC that's dealing with multiple stakeholders because, you know, your teams are exhausted. They're working really hard. And this this is where, um, you know, Des is a really smart lady and she's done all this great work. I want to make it clear that this project is very much her project. But that's where our conversation started to get interesting because um, she would say to me, you know, oh, this is, this is the risk and this is the treatment. And I'd start thinking about it and I'd realize that, you know, there was a lot going on here in terms of risk, some of which we'll capture a bit later. But now, the main one there is the sort of strategic risk of, well, vulnerabilities are going up. And if we have more vulnerabilities, that's going to be more patches. And more patches is more patch management, right? And I think everyone's exhausted with that at the moment. And that's why we need to start thinking about some of these things and gathering data on some of these things. So I'll let, I'll let Des move on, and I'll just uh, uh, occasionally chime in to uh, make a few points towards the end. Perfect. <laughs> Good. So. If we can't install the patch on time or the engineers actually, then we usually get like one of those four problems, usually just orally and they don't, don't document it in another way. So if it's a resource problem, they usually don't have staffing issues uh, or budget other priorities and you should be documenting this. Um, if you have a compatibility problem, so this usually means that your product, uh, the patch can't be installed on that version that you have um, installed or if there's some other kind of problem, you want to document it because that's actually a risk. If you do have a bad SLA, and with a bad SLA, I mean that you do have an SLA in place that, for example, for the network engineers, only allows them to install a patch like four times a year, and they just don't have any way on how they can install this patch on time for you. That's something you want to document because the more facts you create with this uh, statistics, the more um, information you afterwards have to actually argue against SLAs or find out if they're can or should be a contract adjusted for this. And with the support problem, I go towards partner dependencies. If your partner or if the partner that you have the product from is not delivering you with a patch um, and you can't fix the vulnerability, you should be documenting this as well. So all of this um, will be very important just towards more um, greater risks, but we get to that afterwards with the KPIs as well. Um, Aaron? Yeah, this is this is a this is a perfect example of where my curiosity was piqued, right? Um, so Des was talking to me about how these these uh, requirements on the SOC were to scan for something, and then you see that you've scanned for it and you ask them to repair the vulnerability, but they don't have enough downtime window to actually do that. And that's uh, what you know in economics or risk we might call conflicting incentives or perverse incentives, where two different sides of your own organization, in other words. The, the salespeople who are negotiating the contracts and the SLAs are now in conflict with your SOC um, support team. And that is really funny, but it's the kind of thing that we see happen all the time. And it's really interesting because your SOC team's getting exhausted, constantly finding these risks, and then no one's treating these risks. And it doesn't usually occur to you to go, hey, should we look at the SLAs? And should we find out if the SLAs have a, a provision for how much downtime is available? There's no point in us asking them to fix more than they can fix according to the same contract. Um, and then by changing those contracts, you can realign those incentives. And often when you realign the incentives, you realign the risk. And one of the things that I think many people forget about risk is, yes, it can be mathematical and relatively objective, but it's often very subjective in the sense that the SOC is facing the risk from a different angle than the customer. 
And until you align that view of risk inside a contract, you're going to have these conflicts. So I guess our point is when you see these, these really interesting entrenched debates within your organization, look for a realignment of incentives to help you solve some of those problems. And, and the solution might not just be writing more intrusion detection rules or, or something in engineering. You might have to get out of your comfort zone and go and speak to some other people in the organization. Yes. Yeah, because security isn't only your job, but like there's some governance and security management team and they have a part in a role as well. So when we went on and we couldn't uh, uh, de deny the whole thing happening or have some other way of degrading the attack, we at least want to try to detect it or discover it. And if you can create a detection, it's usually via a security monitoring rule or a more integrity compliance configuration monitoring or even some hunting action or you increase visibility by adjusting some other configuration in the background. So you can do something about it. But if you can't, you usually also have a few things that go wrong. And um, the first four categories here, events cannot be locked, detection pattern unclear, lock event ratio, and reasonable resource problems are usually the ones that I will point most to the SOC because I think the other people can't do something about it. So um, events cannot be locked is usually, this is a very specific attack. And um, then, you don't know yet how to detect a specific attack and um, then you need to find a close enough approximate, uh, approximation and this can very well be that this means more overhead in your team as well so um, you need to find out if this is actually a good way or if you in this case just want to say that the events cannot be locked in an efficient manner um, you want to say um, if the detection pattern is unclear i would usually say that it's probably more an education problem that they don't know how to detect it but it can also be and i don't want to point this only to the analyst but i mean if not even the analysts can get it right nobody else in the company will so if you don't know how to detect it you should be documenting it and take it as a risk um, then the lock event ratio is unreasonable that's a really economic problem so you might want to verify if there's more economic alternatives but you might not be able to please document that this is not in the current way you have your setup um, reasonably doable so um, this is a different kind of problem than the others and with a resource problem at the detection point is really that your st sock stuff is has like different priorities or you just have too little and you should be documenting this as well. And this is also some kind of risk is if all of the SOC employees are too busy with other things, um, you want to document this. Um, so yeah. Then the other categories are more towards the middle one, the like locks cannot be delivered and resource problem in delivery is usually the engineers, something in the transmission way towards you is going wrong. So um, it's probably a firewall rule that you can't adjust. And it can even be that it's your partner at some other site that is not doing the change. So it might just be that it's not you, but you should be reporting that the logs cannot be delivered to you. And this is why you can't create a detection. And um, if there's other people having resource problems, that's also something you want to report a risk to. I mean, those people then need to verify their priorities and their um, way they're set up. and you should be documenting it because the worst thing that can happen is that someone something happens and someone comes to you afterwards and tells you you didn't create a detection and you didn't document why you couldn't create the detection because you have actually tried it and the last few points here are no tool for logging is available or no process demand and responsible for the detection is available which is usually a governance problem so security management somebody in an overall state probably also security architecture just didn't think of creating such a possibility to create to get those tools in there and this locks that you need and so this usually can't be resolved by the SOC themselves so document it so they do get the data to create such um, detections um I would go on because we want to go to the KPIs and the benefits um I created a few KPIs again, um, like the last time for now technical security compliance monitoring and integrity monitoring. Um, so for example, um, we have here a number of legitimate viol violations authorized by change. You do see that if you have an alert in the SOC and it was actually authorized by a change, by an official change management process that was in place, this means the SOC wasn't included in that process. And 
that's a process problem you want to fix and to make sure that you um, are not running after things and always, because this really should be like stopped at the beginning. Um, if you more have like configuration errors in the baseline, um, then it means that the quality of the security baselines that you have is probably not that good. So you want to create statistics of that as well. Um, number of limitations and verification products found um, means that your product that you're using is probably not that good. So you want to have a look at it as well. Um, if you create statistics on it, you can get the facts to like create the changes that you need in your infrastructure. And um, number of activities with no change required. This is a hard one. I mean, if no one actually asked to document something, some change that is done in the infrastructure. So for example, if in the cloud, a configuration has changed and nobody cares to document it in a change where you could verify it with, you have no chance of making sure that this was actually an official change. And this means that the SOC is running after security problems that apparently the governance team and security management doesn't think is a problem because they never defined the scope to be covering that areas. So make sure that the security management and the governance people know what should be covered and if they don't think it's reasonable to cover it then i don't i would really question if you as a SOC need to run after those events and the last event this is um <laughs> yes hey go ahead if you want you can no, go through the rest of the slide just, i was just, just gonna yeah, no, I wanted to say that the number of unauthorized chains without legitimate calls is pretty much one KPI where you afterwards get a um, security incident from, because this is the one that stuff that you can't verify and that you need to further analyze. Now, Aaron, sorry. <laughs> no problem, no problem. It's a little harder when we're not in person. We can't make any uh, eye contact as easily. So, um, yeah, this is a good opportunity to say, you know, here's an operational risk, right? Like if you're uh, you're performing these actions and you are detecting these things and no one has ownership of it in your organization or in another organization, that's an operational risk because you're not blind to the risk, but your um, your hands are tied in the sense that the organization isn't reacting to anything. And that's a, that's a big difference than a, um, a, a compliance risk, right? Because you're looking for someone to own that risk and do something about it. Also, you have policy risks, uh, which might be, you know, the, a failure of the policy or the way the policy is designed or the SLAs that we talked about earlier. Um, this is a good opportunity to talk about endogenous and exogenous risk. And I know many of you uh, will already know what those are, but I, I keep in mind that FIRST is a very international organization. Some of our uh, non-native English speakers may not have encountered these ideas before. So endogenous is a risk that is inside the organization that flows from the way the organization does things. Um, I'll use the earth as a metaphor. Volcanoes are an endogenous risk. They happen on earth. They're part of the earth's processes. An exogenous risk is one that comes from outside the organization. And usually is is a big surprise right so like a meteor striking the earth would be an exogenous risk there's there's not really something inside the way we're behaving that we can do to change that now that doesn't mean that you can't treat an exogenous risk it just means that the way you treat it is usually a bit different and the way you detect it is definitely different because to be able to see it coming you need to be outward facing a lot of times in risk we talk about inside out risk and outside in risk so most people i think they think of the inside out model where i'm an organization I map my different risks to different things and I try and keep track of different treatments. But there's also that outside in view where I'm looking outwardly to figure out what risks are coming my way and which ones are exogenous. So that's uh, that's a useful paradigm to help you think about some of these things. Sometimes the solution might be uh, under the things you control in an endogenous sense, or it might be in the way you do business with your business partners or the way you interact with your uh, supply chain or the the ways that you um, make the requirements in the software that you use. Um, so just because a risk is exogenous doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. Um, do you want to move on to the next yes. slide and we'll yeah. Uh, yeah. Because we also have five minutes. Yeah, five more minutes. So we have a few more KPIs uh, for vulnerability management pretty much. And those are like, I'm coming back now to number of delays due to unreasonable SLAs. I mean, this is really something you want to like create into statistics. So you might want to do something in the organization about else you will always have engineers fighting against each other. And this is just not good, gonna be the resolution or the solution for this all. And the number of delays due to resource problems or average delays until um, things can be resolved. This is also very important. I mean, if you're just not having just stuff the way it should be. This is an overall risk that should be checked and it's probably more on a contractual level. 
Um, yes, so the other things are pretty clear, I would say. Erin, do you have um, something you want to add? Elsa would go to next slide, El, because we're running short. Yeah, sure. Just go ahead and move on to the next. And don't forget to launch the poll at some point when you're ready. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. So um, the goal really was identify where time is actually being spent, create statistics for effectiveness of internal security measures and architecture, so you can have an evidence-based discussion and integrate the possibility for directly initiating continuous improvement into the process if you actually are automating all of those kind of things in the background. So that is a really nice side feature. And this one is about the value at risk, right? Yeah, so like looking at those contracts can be helpful to you as well, because you might see the amount of money that your organization is making from those things and how much weight you put on, um, you know, the detection of particular, particular vulnerabilities for particular clients, for example. So understanding that value at risk, even if you're just an everyday engineer, tells you why do we spend so much time as a SOC doing this job as opposed to that job? And it might be a lot to do with revenue and, and how that revenue is being generated or how the value at risk is working. Um, this also helps you get a little more transparency in your risk treatments. So you don't, you know, when we were talking about defense in depth earlier, we, we had a great big list of all the things that we might like to do, deny, degrade, etc. cetera. Um, and the idea is that you want to do all of these things. And that's, that's great in theory. That's like, you know, people who have no, um, they have an infinite amount of money in their bank account and they can spend it on everything they want. I don't live in that world. I'm sure you don't live in that world. So um, the point here is how much money and how much time should we put into each of those things? And we'd like to both reduce the severity and the frequency. Um, and then of course, you know, you can find these things out by, by checking the contract contracts or other um, other things. It might be that your customers have a particular value at risk if you don't meet a certain metric. And so they might be determining the value at risk. And you might need to see that not inside your own organization, but inside another one. And I think um, now's a good time to hand back to Desiree to wrap things up and uh, maybe yeah. take questions and do the poll. Yes. We have two minutes, two questions and the poll. Yes, perfect. So um, just activate the poll because um, this is pretty much, um, I created this poster, I created um, the integrity compliance paper already and Aaron and I are planning to write another paper about all of the vulnerability section. But what format would you most appreciate more infos in? Um, please tell me and then I can try to include this in the next steps. Um, just so we know um, what direction to go. I think I could vote myself now, hey? <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, the question that cool. came I'll, in, check, I'll check the Q&A. The question that came in was already, um, okay. already okay. answered. Okay, so. Um, okay, all right, good. Good, do I get the results afterwards or do we get it now from the poll? Um, it's going just while we're, I believe you okay. make you a co-host and you should be able to see it. Um, okay. Thanks everyone for joining as well. Yeah. And um, yeah. thank you for your time. And um, if there are any questions, we're both on Twitter and um, yeah, just let us know if you have feedback. I'm very excited to just share it. I'm actually also really interested in getting your feedback on it and if it's actually working and if we create the change with this information that we need. So this is really like the key. Thanks everyone. What a wonderful audience. All right, thank you everyone. We're gonna do a 30 minute break and then we'll be back to the uh, next session. Have a great first everyone. Thank you, bye. Yes.